So I started taking photography seriously in 2014. I was doing photography before that. It was something I was interested in, but 2014 marks the year where I said to myself, you know, maybe I can actually make this into something. I was finishing up with college. I was taking my camera to class with me every day. I was dabbling with making photos of people around Atlanta. And that was the year that pretty much changed my life because I became obsessed with trying to make photography into some type of career path for myself. And now 10 years later, it's worked out for the most part. There could have been some things that I did a little bit differently. There's still a lot of room for me to grow both as an artist and as a business person. But today I want to go over some no BS straightforward advice with you. I just want to sit here and talk. I made a few videos like this in the past and I personally get a lot of value from these more casual long form podcast type videos. So if you enjoy this one, this could be something I do more frequently on the channel. So let me know in the comments and big shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. We'll talk about them a little bit later on. So number one is that professionals do not care about camera brands whatsoever. Now, if you've been on photography YouTube or the photography side of the internet long enough, you are very aware that a lot of people attach their identity to the camera brand they use. It's like a tribal nature of humans on display. And I know that sounds crazy, but if you've ever said anything bad about a particular camera brand on the internet, you know there's someone out there who leaves a comment feeling personally attacked. Now, when I started doing photography, taking this more seriously, I thought that was normal. I thought you like had to ride or die with the camera you use. And as I got more into my career, met more of my peers, more people in the industry, I realized that Everyone has the main objective in mind when it comes to photography, which is what gives me the best result? What is the camera and the tool that I can use to do my job the best? And photographers are always looking for that answer. And it's the reason why a lot of professionals, even people who shoot film, typically have a variety of different cameras. Because in certain situations, this camera can do something better than the other one that does something better in a different situation. You know, when it comes to photography and doing this professionally, you are having to create art in a very short window and to be able to create that art in an efficient way and do the most you can for clients or for a gallery or a body of work or whatever it is you're working on you want to make sure that the tool you're using allows you to facilitate that creativity in the best way possible and the camera or tool they use is simply a means to do that number two most people acquire 10 percent of photography skill and think they're good now, this isn't me being harsh or being mean or anything like that. It's more of an observation around most people not being willing to go as deep as they need to to really explore what photography is all about. And I think this phenomenon happens because we have so much access to cameras today. I mean, every single smartphone in our pocket takes amazing pictures. And this accessibility just makes photography seem like something easy. You know, I'm sure we've all looked back at our old photos that we thought were amazing and they're not good whatsoever. It's almost like this excitement around finally being able to create something. You think you're much better than you actually are. And what happens with most photographers is they eventually reach this point where they realize, oh, this basic understanding of this thing isn't enough for me to do what I want to do, they eventually quit because they're not willing to put in the work to gain the other 90% of skills necessary to make the type of photography that they want, which is actually real artistic and creative photography. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work. And most importantly, it takes a lot of presence. I think that is the most important ingredient in the good photo formula, as you would say, being present and paying attention to all the details that are required to make a photo good. This can be your lighting, your composition, your editing, the details in the edit to make sure it looks natural, the retouching. All of these steps require you to be focused and be present. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to do that. But because photography is so accessible, you get a lot of people who just come into this at a surface level and think they're good when in reality they haven't even you know, scratched the surface on what they can do with making pictures. 
Think of it like this. Someone picking up a guitar isn't going to be able to play a song immediately, but anyone can pick up a camera and make a picture and in their mind think, hey, this is cool, I made something. But the reality is, art of photography goes so much deeper. Number three is that composition separates good and great photos. Now, kind of piggybacking off of what I just got done talking about, composition is the main skill in photography that most people never get to because composition is the skill to take the world around you and capture it in a way that is readable and understandable to an audience. And this is a skill that just takes time to develop. Some people have it naturally. If you've ever heard someone tell you you have a good eye for photography, they're not talking about your technical skill. They're talking about your ability to create a composition out of whatever's happening in front of you and create an image that is more compelling and more readable. And unfortunately, there's no way around the time investment that it takes to get better at composition, to understand, hey, if I do this with the photo or stand over here, I'm going to have a lead line pointing towards the thing that I want someone to see. Or, hey, if I do a Fibonacci sequence of this scene or this photo I'm going to make, it's going to be more readable and understanding to a person because this is just something that happens in nature. Or simply using the rule of thirds as a starting point, understanding hey, if I pack out this image and make sure that I have points of interest throughout, this image is going to look better and be more interesting. It's the reason why sometimes you'll see a photo of something random, something that I love to do sometimes in YouTube videos is try to make photos of trash cans and make them interesting and compelling. That's me doing a composition exercise to try to have somebody on the other side of the screen say, you know, I don't know why, but this photo of trash cans is doing something for me and it shouldn't because it's a picture of trash cans but the reason why it works is because I'm utilizing a proper composition I'm creating a photo that is balanced that's understandable and if you understand the power of composition you will take your photos from normal good less than good photos that everyone can make to the great photos that make you professional and make you stand out and if you're into business Photos like this make you a lot of money. Number four, traveling doesn't make a photo good or interesting. Now, this one's a little bit controversial, but it piggybacks off of the last two points that I just talked about. If you are a photographer and you want to make good pictures, learn the fundamental skills that are necessary to do that. Pay attention to the details. Focus when you are out making pictures. People can travel all they want. If your goal as a photographer is to travel the world, by all means, go for it. But don't lean on travel as somehow a magic fix to your images not being fundamentally sound and you not having the skills necessary to make a good photograph. I'm sure if you go on Instagram right now and you search Tokyo, Japan, you will get quite a few photos that aren't really that good. And it's because going to a new place is not going to compensate for all the fundamental skills that are not that fun to learn with photography. Most people have this vision of being able to go travel and it just being fun, but in reality, it's the same work making photos when you travel as when you're making photos in your own backyard. All the same puzzle pieces are required to make a good image come together. So if you're a photographer out there learning, you're growing in your career, you're trying to get better, and maybe you see people traveling on the internet, don't get FOMO. Don't worry about it. Your time to travel will come later, and when you can, you'll have all the skills necessary to actually create images that are impactful and mean something. Who wants to go to Iceland and come back with a bunch of mediocre photos? Nobody. But that's what happens with a lot of people because they're trying to skip a step. They're trying to skip the hard step of learning the fundamentals and just jump to going somewhere new for a quick fix. Number five is that social media should be embraced. Now, 10 years ago when I started photography, I was fortunate enough to understand the potential of the internet. I saw YouTube as the ultimate vehicle to get who I am as a person, the things I'm making out to the world. And I was like one of those dorks when I was in high school, me and my friend Cody, we had a YouTube channel like back when people just filmed YouTube videos on like their webcam on their computer. I actually had two other YouTube channels before this one when I was in college because I just knew that this was the way to get what I was making out to the world. And if I didn't have that foresight when 
I was finishing college 10 years ago, I probably would have just finished physical therapy school and I would have taken out a student loan, which at the time sounded like a bad idea, but now with student loans being forgiven, who knows? might have worked out. Maybe I should have become a physical therapist rather than doing this whole social media thing. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because there are a lot of photographers out there who want to excel. They might say that they don't care about, you know, being able to make money with a camera or being able to turn creativity into a business or whatever. And if that's genuinely you, totally cool. But if you're someone who deep down wants to do something more with the craft they enjoy, social media is the way to do it. There's this whole group of people who seem to have this extremely negative outlook around social media. And not to get like too wacky here, but if your entire attitude is negative, how are you going to get a result that's anything but that? Like, it doesn't work that way. Two opposites can't connect with each other. So if you look at social media as a positive and as an opportunity, there are still going to be its struggles. It's not perfect. You know, everyone thinks they're entitled to other people's attention and being able to blow up on the internet. But using social media as a tool and recognizing its pitfalls and just being okay with it is a really great way to get your photography and get your creativity out to the world. Now, speaking of social media, segue king right here. It's a good time to mention today's sponsor, Squarespace. And the reason I'm mentioning them now is because of all these people who are anti-social media as a photographer, especially learning video, I created a free course on my website, evanramp.com, where I break down a very basic formula to creating Instagram reels around your photography. This is a system that I use that grew my new Instagram that I started at the beginning of the year to 10,000 followers in under 100 days and I lay it all out in this 60 minute course and thanks to Squarespace this course is possible. Squarespace makes it easier than ever to create basically anything at this point. You can create a membership site, you can create a course, you can create a basic website like my website evanramp.com, you can sell your products like your prints, your photo books, your presets, that's what I use my website for, or you can showcase your work with a portfolio, you can contact customers through email marketing, you can sell services through their service selling tools. There's so many options for everyone on Squarespace, and now with their introduction of Fluid Engine, it's easier than ever to create a beautiful looking website. You just drag things around on the page, add in the elements you want, and you can create a custom look with absolutely no web design experience, and they have more advanced SEO tools, which can help you be found through search engines on the internet. I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm lacking quite a bit when it comes to my SEO, but these tools are making it a little bit easier for me to understand and implement into my site. So if you want to see for yourself why Squarespace is the easiest way to take your photography business to the next level, you can go to squarespace.com slash to start a free trial, test out the site. You can follow one of the videos I have linked in the description down below where I go over a number of different ways to use your Squarespace site. And then when you're ready to send your site live, you can use code Evan to save 10% at checkout at squarespace.com slash slash Evan Ramps or a free trial and use code Evan Ramps to save 10% at checkout. Big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Number seven, you don't have to use manual mode to be a good photographer. Now, this is probably one of the biggest misconceptions I had when I started photography, especially doing this as a career. I thought you had to use manual because that's what professionals do. By using manual, you understand how your camera works. But in reality, your camera in a lot of ways is smarter than you. It can override your brain in ways that you might not be able to quickly. And this ability for the camera to override my brain has helped me in a number of situations because there's been a lot of photos that I've made that were just completely on the fly, spur of the moment things. And because I keep my camera in aperture priority, I'm able to have my shutter speed dictated by the camera, thus allowing me to make pictures in the moment and not have to adjust my speed, which years ago was a problem I ran into quite often. I would have certain manual settings set, I'd move somewhere else, the lighting conditions would change, I'd make a photo that was in a split second moment and the photo wouldn't come out because I didn't change the shutter speed fast enough. I, I physically couldn't change my settings that quick because I'm not a computer. So to be a good photographer, you don't have to always use manual mode. You just have to understand how your camera works. And then things like aperture priority or speed priority or auto ISO or putting limits on your ISO become tools that actually make your life a lot easier. And in a lot of cases, only shooting in manual 
can make your life a lot harder. There is a time and place for it. So if you're someone who's thinking, I have to use manual all the time to be a pro, you definitely don't. I use aperture priority all the time. It's personally my favorite way to make pictures. Number eight, your editing style reflects your technical skill. Now, as I already talked about, there was a time where I was using manual mode way too much. I was messing up a bunch of my photos, and at the time, I looked at editing as essentially a fail-safe to fix all the mistakes that I made when I was out making the pictures. You know, if a photo was overexposed, it's no big deal. Just bring the highlights down to negative 100. If a photo was maybe a little bit blurry, eh, no big deal. Bring the clarity slider way up. Bring the sharpness slider way up. We're good to go. And now I realized that this perspective on editing was actually because I didn't have enough technical skill when I was out making pictures. And my style at the time was so inconsistent, I couldn't create edits that look similar to one another because deep down I had no idea what I was doing technically when I was making pictures. And now, years later, as I've gotten better, as I understand how to use cameras more, understand lighting more, understand what just makes a properly balanced picture, and also understanding what I like to see in pictures, I'm able to edit photos in a way that enhances the image. I'm not focused on fixing the photo. I'm focused on creatively expressing myself and bringing an image to the point that I personally feel it looks right. My style is just an expression of my vision and how I want to see the photo look. I go out in the world, I make a picture, and my style reflects the way my brain thinks that picture should look. And the reason I'm able to reproduce this style over and over and over again, like you see on my photo Instagram or even other creators you might look up to online, it's because the technical elements of creating the photo are there and perfect every time. You know, someone like Shortstash Garrett, I actually learned a few things from him way back in the day when it comes to shooting and getting consistency in your edits. He focuses on so many things when he's out making pictures, even down to the proper white balance in his photo, so his edits can be consistent throughout. His editing style is not designed to save his pictures. His editing style is designed to enhance his photos and bring his creative vision to life. Number nine, no one cares how hard you work. Now, when I started photography years ago, I remember putting so much time and energy into what I was creating, and I was so desperate to try to grow a career, to try to gain some opportunities, maybe get some traction online, that whenever these things didn't work out, whenever I couldn't land a client, or I had an Instagram post that didn't get enough likes, or something stupid like that, I would think, Yo, but I put so much time into this. I focused so hard on this. I worked so hard to make this happen. Why is it not received in the way that I want? And now, 10 years later, I understand exactly why. It's because the hard work is irrelevant. It's all about making something that captures people's attention, that inspires people, that gives something to other people. And regardless of if you spend five seconds on it or five days on it, the outcome is all that matters. If someone gets more from a photo that was made in five seconds versus your five-day masterpiece, they did something better than you did. They made them feel something. So never get caught up in using hard work as a metric. Think of hard work as something that gets you to the point to where you can produce work faster. You're essentially acquiring a skill when you're working hard. You're not looking to gain validation or gain an outcome from your hard work. You're looking at your hard work as something that is going to benefit you in the long run. If it takes you five hours to edit a photo one day, you are learning all the pieces to edit a photo that same way the next day. And it might only take you four and a half hours and then down to four hours, three hours, two hours, one hour. And then you're the person who can create a beautiful, compelling photo in five to 10 minutes. And then your business can really start rolling because now you have the skills necessary to demand the attention and the outcome that you so desperately want. Number 10, art and business will always be fighting against each other. Now, this is something that I know more than firsthand. I mean, this is like my entire life as a photographer in a nutshell, this section of the video. And the reason I can speak to this so much is because I started caring about photography when 
I was a kid. My dad always had a camera. I watched him make pictures. He has so many photos on hard drives of like every family event categorized. It's it's actually amazing to see how many pictures this guy has and how well categorized they are. But I remember he had one of the first digital cameras. He had this Nikon Coolpix that flipped. I was just always interested in it. And when I was in fifth grade, I won a statewide photography contest for all of the public schools in Georgia. It's called Reflections. I won for all the sixth graders. It's pretty cool. And um, when I was in college, when the iPhone came out, I was obsessed with just making pictures. And I didn't really know why. And even after I finished college, what made me interested in photography was simply this love of creating, just because I wanted to. And the minute I turned that love of creating into the way I needed to make money, there's always been this push and pull between the two. You know, as an artist, I want to be pure. I want to just make things for the love of making them because I get enjoyment out of it. That, in my mind, is the definition of a true artist. So if you're someone out there who has a full-time job and you do photography for fun, Congrats. You get to say something that a lot of people in my shoes don't get to say. I can't say that I'm always a true artist because there are times where money becomes a part of the equation. Now, I've been fortunate in the last 10 years to be able to structure my business in a way that gives me more of a creative outlet. It's the reason why I have my photo page on Instagram. It's the reason why I sell products. It's the reason why in videos like the last one I posted, I just went out and tried to pretend like I was William Eggleston. Now, the work involved is putting the video together and doing all the business behind the scenes, but creatively, it was nice to just go out and shoot and make the pictures that I wanted and be able to figure out a way to work them into business. But that wasn't always the case. It took me 10 years to realistically get to this point. I spent so much time, especially early on, working with small headache clients, working with the random job here and there for $50, $100. I remember the first job that I got paid, I think like $500 for, I thought I had won the lottery. But also doing a job like that, I remember thinking, wow, this is like nothing I really want to do. Like I'm just making pictures for these people. And don't get me wrong, it was still fun. You know, there's always going to be that element of you using your camera and you still doing this thing you enjoy. But this pure creative expression or expression, excuse me, of, you know, just like the love of photography that we all start with, it begins to be diluted once you bring business into the picture. And it's a very natural thing, but it's something to be aware of. And if you fully love the craft of making pictures just for that reason, creativity, you might not necessarily want to dive into business or at least be aware of the fact that the minute you turn photography into something that makes money, the two things, art and business, are always going to be butting heads and pushing and pulling against each other. But yeah, that is everything I want to talk about today. If you enjoy these more podcast style videos where I can slow down, really just talk and chat with y'all, let me know in the comments because I'll definitely make more of them. If you are familiar with my other videos, you know, I try to not waste your time. I like to be very direct with my speaking and make sure I'm on point. So it's refreshing for me to be able to sit back and actually talk with more of a normal cadence, make the occasional error here and there and I don't know, it just feels like more of a connection. So if you like these videos, maybe I'll do them once a month. Like I said, I get a lot out of these from other creators because you can just throw headphones on. You can listen to the video when you go on a walk or something and digest the information rather than this high-paced thing on the screen video all the time. So let me know. Hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you are not yet, and I'll see y'all in the next one.